Here's another view of the Kirchhoff building with its carvings and archings and wisteria. That arched passageway is delightfully cool during the summer. Hello, during this final week of Drugs and the Brain, we're going to be talking about the very important but very complex topic, psychiatric diseases and especially drugs for psychiatric diseases. Many of you students have told me that uh, this is the reason that you're so interested in the course. And I hope you find that the material that we have treated up till now prepares you to understand at least some aspects of drug treatments for psychiatric disease. Let's get started by recommending again the book by Nestler, Hyman, and Malenka. Uh, you can find a link to it on the course's syllabus page. The three authors Eric Nessler, Stephen Hyman, and Robert Malenka are all psychiatrists with clinical experience, and they've also contributed importantly to research on psychiatry. Each of them have personally, and in private conversation, taught me a great deal about psychiatry and psychiatric drugs. Their material on psychiatric diseases is especially good, and two chapters that we will be using this week include Mood and Emotion, chapter 14, and Schizophrenia and Other Psychoses, chapter 16. I'd like to remind you that a psychiatric disease can be diagnosed only if a person has clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. So those societies that try to marginalize people if they are politically or socially inconvenient by calling them mentally ill are actually not adhering to our definition of mental illness. And the other point to be made is that the statement 90% of suicide victims have a mental disorder derives in part from the assumption that any person who destroys himself has significant distress or impairment in his functioning. We will be discussing major depressive disorder, bipolar disease, and schizophrenia in that order. And as usual, we will go through our six-part description of the diseases. Uh, we will treat clinical descriptions uh, a bit more cursorily than usual uh, because the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the Diagnostician's Bible, is undergoing a transition from the fourth to the fifth edition. And there will be some changes that occur over the next year or so in the definitions of psychiatric diseases. Uh, we will treat the genetics of psychiatric disease. Uh, when we get to schizophrenia, I will remind you that these are complex disorders and that they are polygenic, multifactorial, and partially penetrant. We'll explain what those means. Uh, we'll discuss the pathophysiology, which is a very important topic for psychiatric diseases, but also our frustrations that we know so little about the pathophysiology. We'll discuss biomarkers for psychiatric diseases and animal models. And I'll remind you that these animal models rarely account for or reproduce the so-called therapeutic lag the two to three week period that it takes a psychiatric drug to achieve its full effect. When we discuss bipolar disease, we'll talk about the heterozygote advantage. And uh, of course, we will emphasize drug therapeutic approaches, both the existing ones and how they work, and the experimental ones and what their prospects are. We'll also discuss right here and then not again, the challenge posed by the placebo effect. Often in clinical trials, patients want to feel better and they like the attention that they're getting from the trial conductors. And so they state that they do feel better. Now, an unusual take on the placebo effect is this book by Robert Scott, who is an historian entitled Miracle Cures, Saints, Pilgrimage, 
and the Healing Powers of Belief, published in 2010. Basically, uh, Bob Scott told me when he finished the book, he realized that he had written a book about the placebo effect. During the Middle Ages, when people knew very little about the causes of any disease, it was natural to blame the spirits or deities. And so a person who got a disease was deemed to be not chosen and was perhaps stigmatized because of the disease. And so going on a pilgrimage or being cured was a sign that that person had found favor in the sight of God or in the sight of the local saint. And so, as we say, this is an interesting take on the placebo effect. Now, psychiatric diseases present a large global burden. There is a unit called the daily, which is the disability adjusted loss of a year's worth of full health. Uh, and uh, this is a chart of the World Health Organization's data for dailies uh, for women around the world aged 15 to 44 years. And so this chart tells us that among high income countries, three major sources of loss of full health, loss of work, loss of productivity, unhappiness, are the psychiatric diseases that we're going to discuss this week. Unipolar depressive disorder, as we'll see, seems to be reported more for women than for men, so this bar would be shorter for men. Schizophrenia, very important. Bipolar disorder, very important, both in low and high income countries. Migraine, another very important disorder of the brain, uh, will unfortunately not be treated in our course just for lack of time. We come back to this problem, how do psychiatric drugs work? The two to three week delay continues to present a mystery. And these quotes from the Nestler book reminds us that we understand a bit about, for instance, uh, the antidepressants that work on serotonin transporters, but we don't understand what happens in the two to three weeks that it takes fluoxetine or another SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, to produce its full effects. And indeed, SSRIs are thought to help roughly 50% of major disorder patients. When we talk about bipolar disorder, we will talk about lithium and another bipolar drug. It too requires weeks for its full effect, and nobody knows why. And then when we talk about schizophrenia, we will again remind you that antipsychotic drugs, which are most often used for schizophrenia, have another two or three week lag, and we don't understand why. Now, in the next three or four lectures, we're going to talk about major depression, and then we will talk about bipolar disorder. These are both classified in DSM-IV as mood disorders,